Welcome to the EW Podcast. I'm your host, Eric White, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by Kevin Bradshaw. Kevin was the subject of the 2012 documentary titled Shooting for Home. Uh, The documentary explored Kevin's relationship to the game of basketball from his childhood to the present day. Kevin is the current holder of the most points scored in a Division I men's basketball game with 72 points. Uh, He also went on to play basketball in Israel, where he once scored 101 points in a single game. So those are a couple of the highlights from your past, Kevin. I know there's some other lower times that the documentary covered that maybe we'll get into, um, but I think that does a decent job of setting the stage for one of the most prolific scorers college of basketball has ever seen. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hopefully I can uh, <laughs> yeah. live up to uh, the introduction. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So thank you for joining me. Um, you come highly recommended by a former guest of the show, coach Gary Zarsky, who was uh, one of your coaches in college at university or U- United States International University. Um, so a lot of what we'll talk about today circles around your history and your involvement in the game of basketball. But I'd like to just start off with uh, what are you doing today? What in 2023, what is Kevin Bradshaw uh, doing? 2023, I am the uh, senior vice president, executive director of City Years San Jose Silicon Valley. Um, City is an organization that works in underserved communities where we work with students that are um, below grade level in math and English. Um, And we also support in the after school, we run an after school program with those same students. So it's two parts. And during school hours, we work with students in the classroom and after school, we run the program. And part of my job is to supervise uh, that staff and also uh, fundraise for our, our organization in Silicon Valley. Okay. Is there is basketball involved in this at all in the after school programs or is it just no. more so educational? It's more academic, more academic, giving that okay. extra needed help to students that uh, need some additional help after school. That's awesome. That's really cool to me because um, I, I, in one of the parts of the documentary I recently watched, they talk about how in the recruiting process, your academic performance was something that was brought up and maybe used as a leverage point for getting you to sign um, commitment letters. Is that something that you you wanted to specifically work with because of your history in uh, the a- academic settings? It's a great question. You know, coming up in the South in, in the late 70s and, and early 80s, um, you know, school was not a big part of, academics was not a big part of stress in my life. So I just didn't go to class and I hung out. And when it came down to recruiting, uh, most people really didn't care. I don't say if they used it against me, they just, they didn't care. It was like, we can get you in here no matter what. I'm doing what I'm doing today because I lacked uh, confidence in the classroom um, you know, during my time in high school and in my first two years of Bethune-Cookman. Um, but after I you know, got some really good mentors and, and, and gave me the confidence, I understood that you know everyone's in school. They don't know everything. So you're there to learn. Um, and once I fell in love with learning, um, you know, before entering City Year San Jose, Silicon Valley, I taught at a high school. I served as a principal at a high school. So I'm in this now because I know the importance of education. And I've been behind the curtain where I've seen far too many athletes that were put in a situation similar to me where just passed through the system, don't graduate from college. And even if they go off to the NBA, some end up still being broke. Uh, and I love to tell kids today, the one thing that I'm, I'm hanging on to is my education. I can't play basketball anymore. But I can continue to teach and work, and that—that's why education is so important to me, and that's why I do what I do. I'm sure you can still play basketball. Someone who put up 101 points in a game has to still have some touch. Yeah, I was, I was telling my son, I, I can still shoot it, but I can't run as fast as I used to. I can play horse. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> fair, fair. I—I I wonder, um, like, what your thoughts are in how basketball helped you get where you are now, because it occurs to me that if you didn't have the skills uh, on the basketball court that you had growing up, the outcome of where Kevin Bradshaw ended up might not be as uplifting or positive. So can you just reflect on that a little bit? And, and yeah, it's a great question. Basketball played? I think basketball, you know, a couple things. I mean, I, I would not have been given a second chance, a third mm-hmm. chance to, if, if it had not been for basketball and also the military, because a lot of people, I think, um, there's something that we I didn't explain in the documentary. When you you have five years to play four years, there's only two exceptions where that's waived. It's if you are in prison 
are if you are in the military. So when I stopped and flunked out of film cook when it went into the military, my clock stopped as far as basketball, division one basketball. So um, had I not been as talented as I was, I would not have been given that second chance to come come back to school um, and play um, play basketball. Yeah. Did that ever, uh, the, the role and the importance of basketball in helping you, you know, progress your life in a positive way? I know there was a lot of downtimes, but when did that sort of realization and an appreciation of basketball hit you? Because I know in the documentary there, they talk about um, whenever you went to the Navy, you had kind of fallen out of love with the game yeah. and it took um, the removal of the pressures of being a division one athlete and the expectations of that that made you fall back in love with it. But I wonder, was that also the same moment that you realized um, the important role that basketball was playing and who you were and who you were growing to be? Well, I think when I joined the military because I was enlisted, because I had I did not have a college education, I didn't have a college degree. I remember going into the mil military and being, coming from stardom and being, you know, well-known and, and celebrated. And then now I'm in the military sweeping floors and, and doing all other sorts of things. And I remember watching the officers who were tasked to tell me what to do. And I remember thinking to myself, just two months ago, I was in school with similar people. And now they're telling me what to do. And the only difference is they have a college degree and I don't. So that's when I understood the power of getting that degree. Because I was in college you know, a couple months before. Now I'm on the ship. And I have young people similar to my age telling me what to do. And it's just because they had that college education. I'm like, I had an opportunity to receive a free education. I didn't take advantage of it in the right way. So I think that time in the military really humbled me, but it also helped me grow up um, and, and, and gain confidence. And, and I think the group of people, as I mentioned in the documentary, that I started to hang around had a heavy influence on my, my life, my well-being, so that when my four years were up in the military, I had all the confidence in the world to go back to school um, and enter the classroom because I had been around grown people working real jobs, um, and I was motivated to get that piece of paper. Yeah. So you don't think that your success, because the um, coach Gary Zarsky recruiting you and bringing you to USIU occurs after your time in the Navy and the military here in San Diego. Um, you don't think that would have happened and your, your successes as a scorer there would have occurred had you not spent that time in the military? Absolutely. Well, I, you know, I think on the court, I think I would have continued to, I, I would have been able to do it. I think the Kevin uh, off the court was the big issue because I was well on my pathway when I was uh, serving at uh, doing cooking my first two years, I was progressing each year, right? Um, but I think the Kevin off the court grew up and, and that helped me on the court as well because I was a more mature person. Um, and also no more drugs, no more uh, alcohol, things that nature, things that I was indulging in, um, in my high school years and my first two years in college and the group of people that I hung around, um, it helped me back, I think, from my full potential on the basketball court. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. So going in the military, being around a good, healthy group of people, working hard, um, gaining my confidence. Now, when I went back to school, I, I didn't get pulled or distracted um, like I would have before early on in my career. And, and, I, and I had a I had a mission. It was not only to play basketball. Ironically enough, I, when I went back to school, I didn't think about, I thought maybe I averaged maybe 11 points. I was more focused on getting that, that college degree. That was the main focus. And I think probably that's why I played better. Because basketball wasn't the issue until my senior year. That's when I started thinking about the league. But before then, I wasn't thinking yeah. about anything outside of getting a college degree. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, that, I could see how that shift in your uh, expectation of yourself or what your intention is, I guess, would allow you to feel more free playing on the court. Right. Even. right. You're not a piece of meat anymore. So coming up before, yeah. you feel like a piece of meat. You were spoke to in a tone of um, as, as if you were ignorant. A lot of athletes won't say that. Uh, you go to all these all-star camps, the way eight hey, people speak to you, they talk to you, you know, they're your friends, but still it was insulting the way they, they talk to us. Um, it wasn't any demeaning us in any way, but it's just like we're athletes and, and, and I wear much more than that. Uh, we're, we're supposed to be student athletes and we don't stress the student enough, especially in the inner cities where we are, are the majority of our students are, are black and brown. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit about your, your growing up. Um, in the documentary, it it doesn't go too deep into this, but it does uh, touch on your you were kind of going through some stuff growing up. You're yeah. a little depressed, maybe a little angry. Is there 
Was it just the your situation that made you feel like that? Was there, I know that it touches on your relationship with your father, who you've since made better with, it sounds like, from yeah. the documentary. Mm -hmm. But was that something that was causing you to have um, issues and turn to things like drugs and alcohol at that time? Yeah, and I think it's, you know, you know I wanted to be very sensitive in the documentary because you're mentioning, you know, family members and things of that nature. Yeah. And one of the things I've learned, you know, since my father and I, we reconciled, is that he he was just doing what he knew, right? I mean, he grew up um, one of 13 kids. Um, by the age of, I think it was 12, he was the disciplinary in his family for his other brothers and sisters where he had to discipline them. Again, take into account, there's no excuse for it, but when we know better, we do better. Um, he Growing up in the South, it was a very racially charged uh, city. And... Mm -hmm. Often my father, he had a lot of frustrations and things that he brought home. Uh, in addition, I don't think, you know, violence was a part, it wasn't violence, but, you know, physical violence was a part of his life um, in his household, you know, disciplining, disciplining his, his brothers and sisters and also out in the, in the, in the city. Um, so me being the oldest and his first child, um, my first five years of my life were spent with my grandmother, not my mother and father. Um, so okay. when I moved in with my mother and father, um, you know, uh, yeah, it, it was just a, not a great situation. He was uh, abusive. Um, it wasn't a healthy household. So what I saw firsthand was violence. Um, how you address things was violence, and how you addressed them was um, with your mouth uh, in a very negative and, and demeaning tone. So that led me to seek for help other places, and that's where the drug and alcohol came. Alcohol started to begin, and especially when I became this big star. Um, mm. um, not everything I went from this kid, it was, wasn't really good early on. One of my friends reminded me of a couple of months ago, there was a situation when I was growing up playing basketball in the neighborhood. Um, the coach had to give out 12 trophies and he forgot mine because I was the last person on the team. He ended up, <laughs> he ended up giving me a trophy and taking it back because he had to give it to someone else. And my friend reminded me of that. So I went from that kid to, you know, that was seventh grade to like, couple of years later, becoming this all-star. Now, everyone that used to, you know, look over me or past me were catering to me. And so uh, that violence at home, not having a he healthy lifestyle at home, um, and then give, be given that stardom, I didn't have, you know, I gravitated towards the one that felt best at the time, and that was drugs and alcohol. Yeah, absolutely. And I can actually... I think one of the things that really struck me while watching the documentary was how much in certain ways I related to your story. And I think a lot of the parts of a lot of aspects of your story are relatable to people. And I would encourage listeners to go check it out. I'll put the link in the, in the I'll, show notes. I appreciate it. Um, yes. Um, but for me, I had a, um, my mother and I always had a good relationship. We had some difficulties, uh, later and like, Later in high school, a death in the family member caused our relationship to be tossed into turmoil and it caused me a lot of pain and went to college holding on to this pain and f filling that void with things like alcohol, drugs, mm -hmm. um, women. Yeah. And um, I think one of the things that happened to me, and I wonder if it happened to you as well, is you almost start to romanticize and hold on to that as a part of who you are. Like, I don't want to get better because this makes me unique. Did you ever go through something? Absolutely. Like that? I mean, that was my best best friend. And and no mm -hmm. one was going to take it away from it. I had every excuse and reason why I was going to do that. You know, I, I could justify it in a minute, right? You could not talk me out of it. So it just took me getting, being forced. And I, and I always say the military was rehab. Because if you know anything about the military, when you go in, you can't, you, you know, have random drug, drug tests. And if at the time, the word was, if you get busted, then you can't even get a government job. So mm. I went in there and it was just a place where I was forced to be clean in boot camp for two months because you, you're you not exposed to the outside world. All you're doing is running, going to class and doing all these other physical things. So by the time I got out of boot camp, those two months, it was like rehab. I was clean. And I and now I'm around a group of people that are not doing drugs. That's why the people you hang around mm. is so important. So going through that rehab without knowing it, you know, you're calling it a rehab, and then being around a healthy group of people that are not doing drugs. And even when they would drink, the one people that I was hanging around, it was, you know, responsible drinking. Now it just put me in a totally different mindset. And I totally forgot about that other part um, of the okay. world. So doing that for four years, it just, you become a new person. So now when I re-enter school, and the drugs around me, 
I'm the person saying put the drugs away. So, um, but yeah, it was the drugs and alcohol, my best friend. I mean, that, that was, that was who I was married to, man. Yeah. Yeah. Then you became uh, milk and cookies as they say. Then you become milk and, <laughs> then you become milk and cookies and you understand the milk and cookies are just as good and there's less money you have to spend uh, for, for the milk and cookies. Yeah. And you don't, you don't have to look over your shoulders when you're, when you're having the milk and cookies. And uh, so I, you know, I went from <laughs> drugs and I call it the milk and cookies. Yeah, that's, that's a fair transition. I can get behind <laughs> that. Um, whenever you were in the Navy, because this sounds like a, a really important period in the transition of, you know, the uh, troubled, skilled basketball player to someone who is becoming more of who they are today. Was there, um, you know, therapy is a big part of my life. Was there something like therapy? I don't know if you actually went to therapist, yeah. but maybe you had friends in the Navy that you were able to talk about your problems in a deep way with. Oh, was that was yeah. talking an important part of that process? It was. It was huge. And, and that group of guys, I wish I could have highlighted them more in the documentary. And I think there are a few, in the, a few of the guys in there in that uh, documentary. But I was around them every day, and when we go out to sea, I'm on the ship with them. So. You're spending three months out in the sea, out to sea with these guys. And then when we were in town, when we were back in San Diego, uh, based on the weekends, they would get in the van and we would go play in tournaments. So that was the therapy for me because we would talk about every and anything. And the best part about those guys that I was hanging around, it was the first time I had been around grown men um, that would tell me the truth. Um, so mm -hmm. if they saw me doing something, I think you saw in the documentary, there's a couple of times I wanted to get out of the military. I wanted to do certain things, but they would pull me to the side and tell me the absolute truth. Um, and, mm -hmm. and one in particular, the, I think the, the old guy said it looks like uh, Fred Sanford uh, in the documentary. He and I fought a couple of times, but he just would call me like he would tell me when I got on the, when I arrived at the ship and I got in a lot of trouble. I'll be sent to the ship's jail uh, where you just eat bread and water and you just. He was like, how stupid are you? They're taking your, they're, and he was, I was like, what? He was like, they're taking your money. You're sitting in a jail, you know, all day. And then you wake up and you work all day. You eat bread and water and you continue to do the same thing. You are the stupidest MF I've ever, you know. And I'm like, whoa. But he became my best friend. And, he, you know, he walked me through like, man, you have to make better decisions. You know, you're responsible for everything that you do moving forward. Um, screw what happened to you as a kid. You know, if you need to go get help, go get it. But that was my therapy to answer your question. The people, the group of yeah. people that I hung around. That's awesome. That's, I think uh, a lot of emphasis these days is put on traditional therapy as it's thought of, of sitting in a room with a counselor. But I think things like that, like having a close support network of friends that you can talk to can be equally beneficial. And so it's always interesting to me to hear the different ways people are able to work through their problems yeah. if it's traditional therapy or with just some friends. Yeah, you have to you have to be careful who you hang who you surround yourself with, and and there's enough good people in the world. I don't I don't knock traditional therapy. I think it's valuable and it helps a lot of people. Um, but your starting point is who who do you have around you? And that's what I tell my son. Like who who's around you, right? And, and mm -hmm. pay attention to that. And if you are uh, if you're embarrassed by the people that you hang around, or you can't bring the people that you hang around about, around anyone else that you love, that's a telltale sign. Um, yeah. So it doesn't matter color. Um, pronoun is just like who's who what type of people are you surrounding yourselves with and that's that was important so that group um i owe them all of my life and everything that i do up to this point because they had a, a tremendous effect on why becoming the person that i am today yeah still keep in touch with them oh yeah yeah we 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 get together every year um for a reunion actually we have one coming up i think it's in um april in, in vegas where we get together nice. we hang out um we go to games like we, we we talk basketball, but we don't go to the basketball court anymore. <laughs> some of them are, are much older than me, but we're extremely good friends. They, you know, they've been a big part of my life and everything that I that I do. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Well, I think um, that's a good transition point into talking about the record, the the Pistol Pete record that you broke in college, mm -hmm. um, and. I guess, so just for some context for people who are listening who haven't seen the documentary, um, the, your time in the Navy comes, as you mentioned before, in like an in-between point of two college careers, one at uh, Bethune-Cookman. Bethune-Cookman right? University, yes, yeah, HBCU, historically back university. In, in Florida. Yeah. Um, and that kind of fizzles out, and then you need to make money for your 
new uh, your child that's on the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you go into the Navy. From there, you end up being recruited, as mentioned, by our mutual contact, Coach Gary Zarsky, um, to USIU. And I wonder, was it – so in the Navy, you rediscover your love for basketball by playing with your shipmates and traveling around, doing these tournaments, kind of dominating, it sounds like, a little bit mm-hmm. um, from the documentary. Is it – basketball that gets you back into the university system or is it the desire to get your degree so what just give a little context really quickly so when i would travel around and play with my my ship so it went from the ship team and then we formed then there was a so if you were good on the ship team then the base formed a base team so you have several ships on the base so off of the base now you have two to three players from each ship on that base team Mm. this base team would travel around while i I was on the base team traveling around and playing in different tournaments during the weekend in San Diego uh, in different bases. I knew nothing about what they call the all Navy team. The all Navy consists of the best basketball players in the entire na- in, in the Navy. Um, and so if you are enlisted, that means you were on a ship without a college degree. Or if you went to the Naval Academy and you graduated, you still needed to give your the Navy two more years because of your commitment. Um, so, I, unbeknownst to me, someone saw me, they said, oh, this guy needs to go off with all the Navy team. I get called up to Vallejo, California to try for this team, um, not knowing what it is. And it was around, I want to say around 80 something people trying out for 12 spots. Dave Robinson walks in the gym. I knew who he was because he had been at the Naval Academy and, but he had just signed his contract with San Antonio. But again, he needed to stay in the military for an additional two years. So this all Navy team travels, if you make that team, which I made, then we traveled around for six months out of the year and played. So mm-hmm. playing on that team, teams, uh, university started to look at me. So Arizona State started to look at me. San Diego State uh, recruited me. Of course, Gary Zarsky, if you met Gary Zarsky, you understand why I chose USIU out of, over the other schools, because he's, he can sell you the clothes off your back, <laughs> right? And, yeah. uh, and he just has that good human touch. And so... Um, when the opportunity presented itself and I said, well, I can receive a scholarship and I understood I could go free of charge. My only concern was my grade point average because I had a zero point, whatever uh, grade point average and to go to uh, receive a full scholarship. I didn't know if that would be possible, but all the schools that were recruiting me said we could bring you on a probationary um, term. So now I said, okay, cool. I'm going to go back and get that education because I remember starting the Navy, people telling me what to do. And I'm like, I could be in that position. Um, and, um, so education was the first thing. And I only thought again that I, Eric, that I would probably average 11 points, but I remember Dave Robinson saying something to me, uh, when I was on that team, um, after I made the all Navy team, there's another team called all Armed forces, which is the best in the armed forces, Navy, air force, army. And so I made that, oh, wow. so I made that team on that team, a, 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 a good fun note would be Kevin Houston, who led the nation from West Point. He played for Army, and he played on that team with me. Uh, So him and he and Dave were were telling me at one point, hey, man, you have two years of eligibility to go back. Now they knew a little bit more about me. Not everything. They didn't know my past. Um, But they knew I had two years of eligibility. And Dave said, you have to go back to school. And he said, I would be shocked if you're not in the top five in scoring. Um, And when he said that to him, I'm like, I'm going back to school, right? So that (laughs) Dave Robinson telling me this here, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, heck yeah, that's awesome. I didn't know uh, all those different levels yeah, to yeah. the the teams there. That's mm-hmm. cool. And I guess uh, Coach Zarsky's philosophy in basketball is a perfect marriage with your uh, scoring ability. Yeah. I'm sure that was a selling point for getting you to USIU. Uh, more so, I mean that was that was important, but again, it wasn't the top because I felt anywhere I would go out would be success. I could play, but I, I wasn't focused on that. The thing the thing that stood out to me about Coach Zarsky coming from where I came from him looking at my GPA and him looking me in the face. And now I was a more mature person. I, I heard all the BS from all the top coaches in SEC. I've seen everything before um, as a child and, and as a child mentally. And, and all those things excited me when I would go on these visits and, you know, get the mm-hmm. girls, get this, get that. <laughs> but what really stood out to me about Coach Sarsky, he was very authentic. I felt, you know, I, I felt the people that I've been hanging around, I grew up, I grew as a person and, I saw things differently. So he impressed me just coming and saying, this is what we have. We're not going to, we're not a school that we're going to buy you this or buy you that. I can't do all that. But he said, I can promise you okay. that if you show, if you come to my school, you will graduate because I'm going to hold you accountable to it. Be 
are above average. And he said, you will not play for me um, if you drop below that. And by him saying that to me, I said, okay, this is some, this is who I want. This is the type of person I want to work with. Um, and sure enough, he did it and I graduated. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a really cool part of the story yeah. because I know in the, some of the other parts in the beginning, there's a lot of, in the beginning of the documentary, kind of earlier in your story, there's some issues that happen with being sold a, a false bill of goods by these colleges and, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, I don't say, so they tell you the truth. They say, well, this is what we're going to pay you. This is what we can do mm -hmm. for you. Um, but don't take those classes, right? That's, because <laughs> we don't think you're a good enough student. Bethune-Cookman, and I do want to give credit to Bethune-Cookman University. Um, in the documentary, you saw that I had an opportunity to go back and thank that coach that uh, was there. Because in the end, they did exactly what they were supposed to do. They didn't pass me through the system. Had I went to a predominantly big university in SEC, I would have gotten passed through the system because I have several friends that I know that went to these schools that didn't graduate, people that I know from my era. Some went on to do great things, but some didn't. And um, they got passed through the system. So luckily, Bethune Cookman said, enough is enough. My behavior was out of control. Um, and I remember him calling me in and saying, you have to go get some help. You can come back in a year, but you have to go now. You, you, you flunked out. So I'm, I'm grateful um, that they did that because had they not done that, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Yeah. Well, that was actually going to be another question later on, but that's a good, uh, good point to ask it. It sounds like you're grateful then for, you know, initially whenever you're going through the recruiting process as a high schooler, the thought of attending Florida is uh, a real possibility. And maybe had you gone there, your life would have been different in terms of your uh, career in basketball, maybe end up eventually being drafted. But it sounds like you are perfectly happy with how yeah. the decisions you made played out. No, you know, at the time, you know, people made it not a, like it was not a great decision, but knowing who I was, um, I would have been self-destructive at that university and it wouldn't have been their fault. I would have got passed through the system. If you look at the graduation rate in the, I'll say from the sixties through the eighties of African-American athletes that went through that school is very low and it's not the school's fault. We accepted it and we do, that's what was happening. I would have gotten passed through the system. They would have kept me in school for you know a couple of years, four years, and I wouldn't have been eligible to go back. Um, that stop point um, for, that Bethune Cookman, when he stopped me in my tracks, I wanted to give my talents to a black university versus a white university um, because I saw the hypocrisy um, where I grew up as a kid where we couldn't even come on the campus, you know, if we wanted to play. But now when I'm the celebrated person, red mm -hmm. carpet is being rolled out. And then also I knew a lot of the athletes that played at the University of Florida and I knew they weren't going, you know, it was, it was a party, right? It's not a knock on the university, it's on the individuals. Um, but Bethune Cookman, I always say they did exactly what a real university is supposed to do they didn't pass me through the system. And because I was such a top athlete, they could have easily said, keep him in school for another two years, but they didn't. Um, and I was upset at the time, but I'm so grateful now. And I'm grateful that I was able to come back and say, thank you for doing that because it stopped me in my tracks and gave me an opportunity to self heal and uh, get my, my stuff together. We left off talking a little bit about the uh, difference between going to Florida and uh, Bethune, your eventual decision race was brought up as part of that. And I think that's a really interesting part of your story that is kind of woven throughout every level of it, really, the early childhood, even to uh, USIU, whenever you break mm -hmm. Pistol Pete's record. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, can you give a little context about what happened with that record, uh, the story of um, how it was broken and how it was received for the listeners? Yeah, so it, it, it's a crazy. It's, it's really when I, when I look back and I think about it, my, I'll start with my junior year. So my junior year, I walk in from I'm a celebrated military guy um, coming in. I'm second in the nation in scoring behind Bo Kimball. Uh, I think Bo averaged like 35 that year. I was 32 when we played against Lala Marymount that year. Bo Kimball, uh, Hank Gathers, I I scored 54. So it's that type of game, right? And we lose by that time, maybe, I think it was maybe eight points. So in, in LMU was a top 16 division one school that year. Um, they played against the likes of LSU and all these other places. The following year when the school goes bankrupt and now we lose a lot of our players, I'm still the same player, but we lost, we lost maybe three of our key players. So now our record is not what it was the year prior year. We were in a, a pretty decent record. 
So now we're losing, but everyone's like, it's a terrible team. It's like, no, we we're bankrupt and we lost all of our, our players. And I had the option, the NCAA came in and said, you know, your, your current players can switch to another school if they want to. Right. And I said, I'm not going to switch because I, my, my heart was with LS, uh, uh, US international. Um, so leading up to that game, didn't, going to that game thinking I was going to score 72 points. I didn't know what the record was. All I know that I scored 50, 40 year before. I'm always excited to play against LMU. Um, we get into the game. We start playing as normal. Um, I get hot. Halftime, I'm, I'm at, I think, 40 some points or whatever it was. And I knew something was going on because, you know, Zarski, he's in the corner huddling with the team. <laughs> I know him well. And normally he would huddle with me first. And I'm like, well, okay, what the hell is going on? Um, and some people walk in the locker room. I see some people talk, talking to Zarski, and the word was is recommended that you know Zarski said, "Damn, Kevin's about to, he can break a record," and you know we were told not to do so. Um, oh, you were told there not to do so in the in the. Anyway, I don't know who the people were. They would say it wouldn't be a good idea if you did break it. If you did break it. Wow. And I didn't. I didn't pay any attention to it. I'm you know I have a militant mindset. I'm I'm, I'm just playing basketball. I, mm-hmm. I don't play these politics. Um, we go out the second half, um, I break the record. Um, and it was just became a, and from that point on, it became really nasty. It just, and I always, I'm always baffled um, how ugly the world can be. And, you know, we, it's a lot of good in the world, but here you have this kid that is, was very lost, um, well-documented, everyone knew who I was, served our country for four years. Um, and now all I'm doing is trying to get my education to play basketball to the best of my ability. And I'm being banged for doing that mm-hmm. when if anyone knew anything about me and if people that knew me from my past, I could be doing something totally different, um, that, you know, could land me in jail or killed. So that baffled my mind. All I'm doing is playing basketball and, and race. Um, and, and, and I don't like to bring up race, but you can't run from things that are factual. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would just say, imagine if someone scored a white guy scored 72 points today, what would happen? Uh, imagine if a white guy averaged 37 points, Division One. what would happen? Um, and people could easily say, well, the team was losing, but the consistency that you need to look at of, okay, junior year, 32 points, second leading scoring in the nation, pretty decent average, senior year, 37 average. So something's there, so at least give the guy a shot to try out. You don't have to draft him, but not to be given an opportunity to even try out for one NBA team. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's almost madness when you look today and, Again, you can't find a person that will find, average 25 points without them getting a good, at least a look. Right. So I leave it up now to people because I'm not bitter about it. I'm happy with where I'm at in life, I think. Um, but I think we have to be very honest about the situation. If people just look at the total picture and say, okay, you tell me why. Yeah. Uh, it, it can't be because I can't play. I was an All-American in high school. I played with Vernon Maxwell. You speak to him, he'll tell you what he thinks. Mm-hmm. Played with David Robinson. I played against several people. So... If you know anything about basketball, I don't care what division you are, but if you have it to 37 points, that means you know how to at least put it in, in, in the hoop. Yeah. Um, and then when I go overseas and do what I do over there, so, you know, I'll, let, I'll leave, it to, leave it up to the experts to, to, to come up with an answer, <laughs> but I think it's, it's too easily dismissed because people don't do their research um, and just um, say, well, anybody could do that. If anyone could do it, you would have four or five people that have averaged 37 points or at least – Scored at 72 points by now, but no one has. Yeah. And it, and it was not in overtime. The closest right. person that came to it was Eddie House at Arizona State. I think he had 68 or 69, but it was in a double overtime. Oh, yeah. This, this is a regulation, no overtime game. And all I'm doing is, again, all I'm doing is playing basketball. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not harming anyone. So that's where, um, and the last thing I'll say is this, Eric, I don't think a lot of people really understand I think I heard Norm Norm Nixon say this when he went from the Lakers to the Clippers. When you're winning, it's easy to show up and play. Mm. When you're losing, you have to have some some guts to show up on the court and continue to fight and play. Mm. And anyone that's been on, and if you're losing, doesn't mean you're a bad player. It's just like some the team is better than your team. And so that's it's not easy to do that. And I think that's what's helped me do what I'm doing right now in life because doing that losing time and that losing record. And having Coach Sarsky keep an eye on the prize, and that was you go out and you compete no matter what. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the chips fall where they fall. But I think people too easily sit to the side and judge the 72 points and say, the percentage, <laughs> but no one's going to shoot 50% scoring 72 points, right? That's, that's right. 
And if you average 37, that percentage is not going to be 50% because you're double and triple team. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, that night was a very interesting night. Um, I thought I hadn't done anything wrong, but the next day when I looked at the papers, it was like, my God, it looks like I, I committed a crime. Yeah. How was that? I mean, I can't imagine how angry I would be after such a, a positive moment, positive feeling moment. And then to see that it was not received similarly by other people, how, how angering was that? And how did you deal with that? I don't, I don't even say it's anger. It's you're hurt. Yeah. And you're confused. And, and you're confused, especially um, if you're someone like myself who has made a lot of bad decisions and, and then took responsibility for those decisions. And then you say, now I'm living this clean life. And I'm getting more flack for doing the right thing than I was when I was doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And I asked myself, what is that about? And that's when you start bringing race into it. And you say like, because you can't lie to yourself when you're sitting there and you're watching other people be celebrated for doing less. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, this, I, I don't need anyone to pat me on my back, but to, to critique it to a point of if I should be ashamed of what I've just accomplished. That, that's where, you know, again, you don't like to bring race in, but it hurts you because you say, hey, man, all I'm trying to do is play ball and, and graduate. And I'm not, I'm not trying to do anything to harm anyone. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful to the legendary Pistol Pete. No one could ever be a Pistol Pete. I, I would never even try to be. But I think people held me to that standard. Mm. Um, versus just say, hey, look, look at what this guy did. He scored 72 points and he averaged, he's averaging 37 points a game. Yeah. So... It wasn't a one shot, you know, one shot thing where, where did this guy come from? It yeah. was a progression. So it hurt. If I could use one word, I would just say it hurt because I, I couldn't understand it. I just couldn't understand, um, you know, I didn't need a, a parade, but I didn't understand like, why should I, be, why are people saying I should be ashamed of doing this? Right. And it's a basketball game. So that, that just showed me like, wow, this is, this can get ugly. Yeah. How do you how do you view from today that period of your life in basketball, uh, going from this um, event, the the record breaking night, to the NBA draft, where there's a little bit of disappointment and being overlooked? Like obviously during that time, it's very hurtful and uh, hard to hard to deal with. I'm sure, especially when there's so much expectation for what could be. But how do you view view all that today? Um, at the time, you you, you know you you were you were bitter, you were hurt, you were confused. But again, just like the Bethune Cookman situation, I'm grateful mm -hmm. because it, it grounded me. You know, I started to have the correct people in my life around me uh, when I was in the military. Funny thing happened when I went back to U.S. International and the stardom started to come back. I didn't get back into the drugs, but I did start to have people around me that should not be around me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I started yeah. to be in relationships that I might not should be in. Um, and when that situation happened, Every, you know, I, I, excuse the analogy, but when you grow up in the neighborhood and you turn the lights on, all the roaches, they run in the corners, right? When the lights come on. And I used the analogy of when I didn't get drafted, all the roaches ran away. I mean, mm -hmm. people just like scattered. No one wanted to have anything from going from, again, everything you need, everything you want. Um, and it taught me like, again, I kind of gotten away from my military friends. Mm -hmm. um, and didn't get into the drugs or alcohol, but I just started to hang out with women and doing these other things. And it taught me like, whoa, um, these people really weren't around you for the right reasons. So it helped me make healthier cho choices with people around me later on in life. So it's fun because I wanted to compete and there's nothing worse than you sitting and you're watching a television. I went through this in the military where I would be watching uh, college games um, and even some NBA and, and I'm watching people that I competed against and I played very well against mm -hmm. um, in, in high school and also in college. I remember watching Otis Smith. I don't know if you've ever heard of Otis Smith. He was the GM for um, Orlando. He, he played a, a, maybe 10 years in the league um, and I'm watching him and I'm watching Vernon and I'm like, I played, I played against all these guys and no one knows around me that I'm, I'm watching people that I used to really compete heavily against. Um, so from the standpoint of not to your question, not um, being drafted. It hurt because I felt like a lot of, I let a lot of people down, but I learned in it. And those people who I thought I let down, they, weren't, they were not around me for the right reasons. So from that point on, when I went overseas, I started, when I really started to take a second level of healing, I started to surround myself with people that are, that are still in my life to this day. And I went back to my Navy friends who never left me. I left them early on when I started. <laughs>
in the startup. Yeah. Yeah. That's your story is so, it's so wild to me. There's so many ups and downs, so many highs and lows um, from, and it, it always seems like basketball is just at the heart of it. You know, you, you mentioned you're going to Israel after this time um, to play basketball. And that's where you, one, meet, meet your eventual wife, but two, almost kill yourself, right? Can you yeah. reflect on that period in your life? And, and then maybe we can go into just uh, a larger scale look back. But can you just reflect sure. on that period of uh, yeah. Israel? So when I went to Israel, my first two years, I'm killing it. You know, I mean, boy, that's a bad word to use. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm averaging 30 over 30 points, um, scored 101 points in a game. Um, you know, I have a couple ex NBA players that are over there saying, man, who, where in the hell, where, are you, where in the hell are you from? And why in the hell are you not? Um, Gene Banks, who used to play with the Chicago Bulls back in the day, he was over there. He was older. And he was like, he went to Duke. And um, he was like, what? What are you doing here? Like, what? I Because he, he saw the game. He was actually at the game where I scored 101 points. Mm. Because people in Israel started to speak about this kid that was just, you know, could just score at any moment. So I did that. Then my second year, I, I played pretty well. My third year is when... Um, I met my my wife, who I've been now with for 27 years, um, but we were just friends. You know, she was someone as you saw in the documentary. I tried to get on; she wanted nothing to do with me at all. <laughs> but we became like friends, and so there became a situation where I got injured, and it was around December, right before December. I didn't know Hebrew at the time. My wife, who was we were becoming girlfriend boyfriend, but we were really good friends. And I asked her to come up because I wanted her to be with me when I spoke to the guy about my contract because I didn't have anyone representing me to, to help me that I could trust. And in that meeting, um, I thought I had a guaranteed contract, um, but unbeknownst to me, because you, when you play overseas, you have your English contract, but then when you get overseas, someone in that country writes it in that country's native language. Mm, okay. So there were some stipulations in there, and he was trying to the, the manager was trying to convince my wife, my my wife, who was my friend at the time, like, hey, just tell him to take this X amount of money and go away. I didn't want to do that. The deal went bad. I had no money now. So now mm. I'm reflecting back on everything that happened before, mm. right? Every single thing that happened before. And every, you know, so with everything that I had accomplished, that thing that you brought up earlier, people really putting me down for not scoring, for scoring the 72 points and averaging 37 points because of my shooting percentage or what have you, all these things started to come back to my head. And now I'm in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. I have no place to come back to. I don't have a family to come back. Nothing. Um, and at that time, I just, you know, I, I was ready to give up. You know, I, I couldn't see a comeback because I was injured. It's December. I don't know how the country works. It's only my third year in the country. Will a team ever accept me again? I just didn't know. So I just, I was at a point where I said, you know, it's better if I just end this. Mm. And so I had, um, and I've been contemplating that for a while. Unfortunately, when you have bad habits, you can pick up those bad habits in any country that you're in. Mm. And when I was in the United States, I always surrounded myself with guns, which is not people with guns. And it, and it was where I started to uh, do sports, affiliate with people that I shouldn't affiliate with. Um, I was able to get my hand on a gun. And, and um, it was one of those days where I just say, I'm just tired, man. And I just, I just want to sleep and I don't want to wake up. Hmm. And uh, I just remember, I think you saw in the documentary, uh, you know, it wasn't scripted. I, you know, she saw something in me. She's so, so connected to me. Um, but the good thing, she couldn't stop me. I just said, this is what I'm caught thinking. I don't know if she really thought, but she said her piece. And you saw what she said in the documentary about mm -hmm. how selfish of you. If you want to do that, if you want to go and blow your, you go and do that. But that's a selfish ass move if you're going to do, if you do that. Um, so I just went out, hung out for about, I think about six hours and um, drank and um, put the gun to my head. And um, thank God I didn't pull the trigger, started to cry. And um, the only saving grace at that time, I, I believe it was God. But I also thought about my, my wife who we hadn't gotten married yet, but I, I loved her dearly. And, and that stuck in my mind and I went back home and, and she and I, we fixed it from there. And uh, she became my therapist, so to speak. <laughs> yeah from that moment on and she helped me get healthy and I returned to basketball a year later. Wow. Man, that's, 
So wild. I can definitely relate to having a partner who sees uh, the best in you and helps you pull yourself out of those dark times. Um, I think that's very important to have for sure. Oh yeah. It, it, it's so, it's so, again, it goes back to people and it's just so important and, and, and that ugliness. And that's why I try to spread hope through what I do right now. Um, working as a teacher, Dean of Students or Principal in these inner city schools. I now working as an executive director because I know what it's like when people look over you or look around you. Um, and it hurt. I mean, I, 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 if I could communicate anything to the sports world, and that would be like, go and enjoy the sports for what they are. Mm -hmm. Because everyone on that court, I don't care. My heart now goes out to a Russell Westbrook. I'm like, that's a human being. You, you know, these things that you say, I don't care how much money he has. He's out there just trying to play basketball. He could be doing something, I'm sure, different than what he's doing right now. But appreciate the sport and get away from this craziness of really talking to people in a certain way. Because it affects, if you don't have a strong it affects us no matter what. We're human beings. And if we did that same thing and we went to somebody's workplace and did that right now, they would want to go to HR and say, you can't do that. So, but for athletes that may be more talented than us, we, we bring all our, not all, but some people bring all that, that negative energy and they, they forget that that's a human being yeah. um, that you're talking to and you're talking about. So all those things that were said to me in the past, that when I was thinking about that suicide and that gun was to my head, um, they, those things came back. They mm -hmm. were playing back in my head. But luckily, there was some good stuff that people I said that was coming back. But th that negativity and those negative things were like, and I remember always just saying, I flunked out of school. I was on drugs. I was just, I'm just trying to do my best. I may make mistakes, but that's all I'm trying to do is do my best. And I don't need anybody to, to give me any extra credit for it. But for God's sakes, why, why would you demean a person? Mm -hmm. for doing something that you may not be able to do because I've never seen a person that's averaged 30 points to mean another person is averaging 30 points. It's always a person that couldn't average the 30 <laughs> right. points. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen a, a record breaker. When you look at that list of people, myself, um, Pistol Pete, uh, uh, Johnny Newman, if you ever heard of Johnny Newman, he, uh, from, he ended up being one of my coaches overseas mm. oh, that, wow. that, that went to Mississippi State that was on that list of, I think he, his record was like 62. So when he first met me, he's like, you're the guy that scored 72. What a phenomenal thing. So, yeah. Because he understood what it took to do that. So, again, I'm sorry to be long-winded, yeah. but I think it's important when it gets to suicide that people really understand. You know, it's not nice once a person kills themselves or, or hurts themselves, say, oh, what a shame. You know, like, what, what led up to that? Of course, we're responsible for it if we do it. But there's a lot of ugliness out there, man. And you just don't know where people are on their mental scale right now. We talk about mental health so much right now. Um, and especially, you know, when we start talking about black men, we go through so much. Um, yeah, so I was in a very, very, probably the darkest place that I've ever, ever been before. And I really wanted to, to just go to sleep and not wake up. Oh, man. Well, I'm glad you didn't, first off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very glad you didn't. Um, yeah, I mean, coming to that ending and having uh, basketball or at least the uh, discussions of who you are as a person around the game of basketball, be part of that soundtrack that's playing in your head as you're contemplating this. And then thinking about all the highs you've had from basketball, your relationship with basketball seems very complicated to the outside observer, to someone like me who says, this guy was so good. One of the most prolific scorers college basketball the game has ever known. And yet it took you to such dark places as well. How do you view like if you were going to write your Wikipedia page and it, it said uh, basketball did this for Kevin Bradshaw, what would you say? Basketball helped Kevin Bradshaw find Kevin Bradshaw. Mm. Um, and, 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 and by that, what I mean, what's important, you know, um, so often sports become so important to us. I can speak for myself because other people are living through you. Mm hmm. Um, if you if you have an athlete that's come comes from a solid home, has good mentors, basketball is important, but it's not their top priority. Is it? But if people are living through you, um, and you get a lot of other people to hang on to you, um, you get lost and you lose yourself. So basketball helped me find me and what's important in my life, um, because I think what continues to get lost is I'm growing up in the '80s. 
and the majority of these athletes that I'm seeing on television, I have some sort of a relationship with. Mm-hmm. And that's weird to be on the other side. And you're like, you know, I'm watching a game and I, between two teams, I'm watching on two to three players on each team. Like, I, you know, I, I, I play well against these guys. But basketball really helped me find myself and to discover that education is, is important, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, and just giving it everything you got, whether you're winning or losing. Because in life, off the court, there are going to be tough times, and you have to be um, very persistent in your with your mindset. And that's helped me in the field that I've gone into, to go into education with my background. Um, I'm not your typical academia person, if you, if you, if you look at me, who or where I come from. But I know what I'm doing, and I'm confident in what I'm doing. And basketball has given me that confidence to say now, like, hey, you know what? I know how to score points. If you want to put me down, put me down. But I'm not listening to you um, because I have a mission, I have a, a focus on what I'm doing. But basketball helped me find Kevin Bradshaw. I'm happy when I look in that mirror with the person that I am um, today. And I think basketball played a, a, a pivotal role in that because the bad helps you acknowledge that's not really important. Like that, 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 and, and so this is important. So to answer your question, I hope that's that's what it helped me. It really helped me find Kevin Macho. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I think it's uh, difficult but useful to have things that pull the monsters out from under the bed and bring them into the light. And you can either deal with it or you can, you know, turn the lights back off. Like you turn the bike off and, and and you find out the things that trigger you, and you start questioning yourself. Well, why? Why, why, why do you let, why does that bother you? What this person is saying about you when they can't even do half of what you've done. And then you dig deeper and you start really, again, it, it refocuses you to realize you on what's important in life. Don't get me wrong. I love the basketball. At one point I hated it, but I'm grateful now because it, it exposed a lot about me, um, how I react to fame, how I react to, you know, just being given thing, given things. So it, it really helped center me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's helped. That helps me in my current position because I think when I walk in a room now, uh, of course the basketball stuff comes up, but within five minutes, everyone is so focused on other things because I can own the room with my life, my lived experiences, mm-hmm. and I can really talk to why education is important. I can really talk to what it's like to have a disability um, and work through that disability um, in the academia world. Um, before I don't think I would have been able to talk about that. So, uh, but now I'm very comfortable talking about it. Um, and I've been pretty successful uh, at it so far. That's awesome. Yeah. And I'll have to link to cityyear.org, right? In the show notes. Yeah, please, please yeah. do city. It's, it's one of, it's an organization that one of the unfortunate things that I found working in underserved communities is we have a lot of schools. We have a lot of organizations that work in these communities. They have a lot of nice PowerPoints and we say all the right things, but behind the scenes, it's just like basketball. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I mean, you know, you have the, it's an ugly part to it. Right. But you know, just like basketball, you have a good part to it. And this organization is an organization that really, from the CEO to the market presidents, um, they're phenomenal. My, you know, they, my market president, her name is Mary Jane Stevenson, phenomenal leader. And just they're all there to do the right things. And I like to say behind the closed doors, I see what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And that's what excites me and motivates me about what I'm doing. So cityyear.org, San Jose, Silicon Valley, look us up. We'll be having a, uh, holding a gala. Maybe we'll invite, we'll love to invite you to it in October. Oh, cool. But it's a lot of good work and, and it's needed in these communities. Um, and the communities are very grateful for it. And, and I think we're being very impactful. Are you, are you a national organization? Is it? Uh... Yeah, we're in 28, we're, we're in 28 states. Awesome. Cool. So we're all, we're all over the globe. Uh, uh, Silicon, San Jose, Silicon Valley is just my market, my, my, my site. But we're Chicago, New York, L.A. We're all over. It's a great organization. I wish wish uh, more people would really look it up and see the great work they're doing. Um, again, I've seen some ugly things behind the scenes before, but they, I'm happy to um, report that when the doors are closed and we think no one's looking. They're trying to do everything that's in the best interest of these communities. And that's why I'm so proud to be a part of this organization. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'll definitely link to that in the show notes as well as the documentary. Um, mm-hmm. Is there anything else you want to end on here, Kevin? Is uh... No, I'm just, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to kind of, you know, share my story a bit. And, um, you know, again, if, if there's anything that people can get from this interview, one, never give up. 
um, don't base your reality or your your lane on what other people have to say about you. Um, and when, as it pertains to sports, it's just sports. Yeah. You know, let's celebrate the teachers. Let's celebrate the people. Other you know, athletes. I mean, I, when I, people ask me, "What's the most important thing that you've done in your life?" I say, "It's what I'm doing right now, um, not what I did on the basketball court." That's minimal. So let's prioritize and put these things in order. Uh, enjoy the sport for what it is, but let's not um, make it out to be something that it's not.